what a great dinner. What a great dinner and great conversations that you all are having. We're so grateful for that. I'm grateful to have you here. Among the folks who uh, have been important to uh, the Soundings Project um, is Dr. Ron Cook. Um, Dr. Cook is a esteemed retired professor uh, of Old Testament at Truett Theological Seminary and uh, pastor of several notable churches in the state of Texas. More than that, he's just a dear, dear friend. So. Uh, to introduce tonight's William Carey Crane Scholars Lecture. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Ron Cook. I'm really not as scary as that look, by the way. Uh, I am very grateful to be here tonight and have a chance to introduce my dear friend. I won't go on and on about that because you'll be able to tell uh, pretty quickly uh, that this uh, man that's going to speak to you tonight is a, is a very dear friend of a number of years. Um, I'm especially glad that the Crane Scholars are here. I, uh, the Crane Scholars became a favorite undergraduate group for me uh, early in my time at Baylor. Uh, and. Uh, I think I encounter more undergraduate students who had a real sense of God's claim on their life for some very significant reasons among the Crane Scholars, and so I'm grateful for you as a group to be here. Uh, last year, November 3, 2022, I set aside most of that day to go online and to watch the presentation of the Opus Prize. Uh, the Opus Prize is the major humanitarian award by the, by the Opus Foundation, which is uh, a significant foundation of the Roman Catholic Church in league with the major Catholic universities of America. It is their most prestigious award uh, of folks who are making a huge difference for humanitarian causes around the world. And my friend Mac was one of the three finalists. I sat there enamored uh, by the people that were presented. Uh, Sister Annie Credidio has established a clinic in Ecuador uh, to treat Hansen's disease in a remarkable way. A couple of friends from Nigeria, uh, Imam Ashafa and Pastor Wuyi have formed an interfaith intermediate mediation center and uh, one of the most um, dangerous parts of Nigeria to bring uh, people of Muslim faith, traditional African religions, uh, Christianity together uh, to mediate the differences in that uh, conflict and violence torn country. And then my friend Mac. Uh, they all spoke and uh, it was the first time that I had followed uh, Mac. He has received, I, I decided not to bring the resume, but Mac has received so many awards regionally, across the South, uh, major awards, you can look it up. Uh, but this was, for me, the pinnacle, uh, for him to just be a finalist for the Opus Award. As they announced the semifinalist, and then Mac McCarter, as the laureate to receive the $1 million Opus Prize. And Mac would say not for himself, but for Community Renewal International that he leads. Uh, I began to think once again what I've thought so many times. I wish everyone could go to Shreveport and just witness what's <coughs> happening at Community Renewal International. It's a true metamorphosis. Uh, I have stopped using the word transformational. I think the, the word has been, uh, has been driven into a lack of meaning, being attached to all kinds of good but incremental and unlasting efforts. 
Uh, community Rural International could be described that way, but Community Renewal has produced a metamorphosis. What was once uh, a city torn by violence and crime and racism, one of the worst uh, in the American South, has uh, been transformed. The major ghettos, and I'll, I might mention quickly five of them, where community renewal has been at work through the better part of 30 years now, have been literally transformed. When Mac went back to his hometown of Shreveport, uh, he uh, went with a vision that I had learned from him when we were young <coughs> pastors uh, in a Texas city. And that vision was to bring the love of God into human <laughs> relationships between person and person and house to house and street to street and neighbor to neighbor and for him across the city that he loved that had been so severely broken. I heard Mac talk about the first time that he walked into the Allendale, I call it a ghetto, part of Shreveport. And uh, it's a miracle that Mac came out alive. And he began to go back over and again and build friendships uh, in that community, person to person. And the metamorphosis began to unfold as this crime-ridden part of the city, where children didn't go outside, neighbors didn't talk to each other, uh, where uh, violence were, was pervasive and drugs as well. The people began to make friends, and Mac showed them how. Person to person, house to house, street to street, across the Allendale community, things began to change. I think you have to feel something to know the reality of it. I remember when that happened to me. I've made numerous trips to Shreveport, and Mac, the day that you took me to the Barksdale Annex, and we walked into a block party, Taxi drivers would not take anyone into the Barksdale Annex a few years before I visited. And we walked up to this splendid African-American man, and he gave us both a hug. And Mac, in the course of uh, the conversation, said, I want you to tell Ron what would have happened to him if he had come here seven years ago. He said, you'd have been a dead man. And he meant, he meant it. And I was taken in that day by so much love and so much joy spread across one whole section of the Barksdale Annex and so much joy, I said, something has really happened in this city. The Shreveport Police Department, the most recent statistics using the FBI's standard of uniform uh, crime reporting has done a study of the five major ghettos. Is it five or more? Four, four out of Shreveport? Well, it may be Allendale, Barksdale, Cedar Park, Highland, Martin Luther King neighborhood, and Queensboro. Those are the major ghettos where uh, community renewal has been at work. And major crime dropped 55%. I'm talking about murders, burglaries, assaults, now, you know, folks, we are statistically numb. Statistics mean very little to most of us, unless you're in quantitative or qualitative research. Forgive me for that. But anyway, we're statistically numb. More importantly, in all of those areas, the neighborhoods have been reclaimed. The purveyors of crime and the drug <laughs> folks and those who had taken control of those neighborhoods have been marginalized and the people who love each other have been stood up. And it is an absolutely remarkable thing to see. If I drove you into one of the, those neighborhoods, we'd go down the street and we'd see these we care signs. And not just in the ghettos, but in middle class neighborhoods, uh, among the wealthy. Uh, the last I saw, 15 to 20,000 we care team in Shreveport, Louisiana. Uh, just remarkable uh, what's taken place there. I listened again this morning to the CBS Sunday morning segment that was done on community renewal and Mac speaking, and he said, random acts of kindness sounds good, but really will usually have no lasting effect. 
takes intentional acts of connected care. Do you hear that? Uh, and multiplied and multiplied to make a difference. I hope you'll watch that segment. I hope some of you will on the Community Renewal International website because at the end of that segment, Mac makes a statement that is, uh, I think, captures his vision uh, and what drives him to lead the ministry that he leads. He said, I hope one day in the human race, some child is going to ask, what's hate? living for that day. I decided not to give you a resume introduction tonight. I wanted you to have a feeling uh, for something <laughs> remarkable that's taken place uh, in, uh, in Shreveport, Shawnee, Oklahoma, Washington, D.C., Cameroon, and on the move across this planet. I used to take young pastors to Shreveport. I haven't done it in a while. Matt got down to serious talk with the pastors. He said, now, I know you all have answered this calling because you want to change the world, but you don't even know how to change your own neighborhood. Mac McCarter is showing the world how to change a neighborhood. I hope you'll listen tonight. He's got something to say. Well, we are living in a, uh, in a day, this day, and if there's some reverberation here, is, is the sound okay with y'all? Because I'm getting some reverberation. It could go down just a little bit. My voice is terribly weak. Uh, I wish I had Ron's voice. I'm, I'm not coveting, but I wish I had your voice. <clears throat> this has been a day of horror for folks that are up in Maine, and uh, it's happening again and again and again. And uh, we're, we're close to being benumbed ourselves, not simply to statistics, but to the horror that we are living in the midst of, and so, uh, I, I have to say to you that we're, we need to work together in this time because we can't simply participate together. Judy and I are members of a wonderful African-American congregation in, in Shreveport and I learned they've got a wonderfully high view of, of the pulpit and that is that no one should break open the unsearchable riches of Christ alone. That it takes all of us and there's no power in the pulpit, they say, unless there's prayer and praise in the pews. And so the, they understand that it's a together experience. And we really are called together in this moment. <clears throat> and it's a calling together to, to not just have a speech, but we're here together to seek to make a difference. And that's critically important, and it's going to take some work. And because this is an unfinished uh, time as we're going through this mess of steaming sewage that folks are having to live through, uh, it's going to take all of us, and I need your help tonight as we walk together through this, not only now, but also in the time that we'll spend together, you know, following hopefully uh, a soliloquy that is really not a soliloquy, but where there is a duality of spirit. Because we need, we need help. And we need that most uh, existential of all prayers, God help me and God help us. And so if you would, bow together with me in just a word of prayer. <clears throat> in 
May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together be acceptable to you, O Lord. For you and you alone are strength, and you and you alone are our salvation. Amen. Well, today, <clears throat> as, I, as the horror unfolded up in, in Maine, not a story that hasn't been repeated over and over and over. Today, uh, I had lunch with my granddaughter, Kate, and I was, we were there at George's, and I was moved to say across the table in, in our booth, I'm so sorry, Kate, for the world that we're leaving. And it's my generation. Just to think of what, <clears throat> what we have not done and what we're leaving behind. And I'm so sorry. But there's still breath in our bodies and there's still a time that we could have hope together. And so I thought today as I was listening of, uh, of that time in American history, it was June the 16th, uh, 1858, and America, the ocean of humanity in America was, uh, was simmering, ready to come to a boil. It was there in a convention in Springfield, Missouri, that Abraham Lincoln stood up to give what had be was to become his famous, quote, house divided speech, a house divided against itself cannot stand. And the very first sentence of that speech, which for 1858 went about as viral as a speech could go. And it went, it became a pamphlet, he made it into a pamphlet and it went all over. And the very first sentence of that speech was this, if we could first know where we are, and whither we are tending, we could best judge what to do and how to do it. And that was a prompting moment for me. If we could first be really honest where we are, and then whither we are tending with clarity and simplicity, we could then best judge what to do and how to do it. And where we are in this present darkness is a place that was described almost 2,000 years ago, and this is the verdict. Not, not the opinion, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men loved darkness rather than the light because their deeds were incredibly self-centered. I always tell our boys and our, our guys that, uh, that just every time you see evil, just substitute, or any time you see sin, just substitute self. Because it really is, you know, evil is really lived, spelled backwards, and it's a life dominated by, I want to do what I want to do when I want to do it. And that stands in juxtaposition to everything that God wants for us, because He does want us to come together, no matter what age we're living in, because it's only there that we're fulfilled together. And so we, can, we could describe the darkness. And it's like truly, literally, a, a litany of incredible pathology and incredible dysfunction. And it makes absolutely no sense that we would, we would hold the sluice gate open that would flood 
the, the wonderful rivers of freshness of human beings and flood it with instruments and instrumentalities of absolute destruction of all that is good and merciful and wonderful in the eyes of God. It makes no sense. And that's the darkness, just a part of the darkness that we're living in. And it's almost that we have, we have become really and truly benumbed to that. And consequently, uh, Vance Havner, the great Vance Havner once had a sermon called Getting Used to the Dark. If you've ever gone from the daylight into a dark theater, you have, to, you have to just wait until your eyes can get used to the dark. When I was growing up in Shreveport, Louisiana in the late 40s and early 50s, if you would have even said that your house had a burglar alarm, we would have thought you were crazy. Or maybe had gold or something. Nobody even thought of that. And the, the only thing that I can remember so many times is because we didn't have air conditioner, Mama said, did you latch the screen door with this little eye hook latch? <laughs> you know, as if that's going to keep somebody out. It, it kept our dog Cookie in. <laughs> but it didn't keep, it wouldn't keep anybody out. But that was, that was what we did in the summertime. Latching the screen door and we were safe. And it was astonishing because if we would have been transported in time to the present time to actually see the armed guards in our parking lots at church, to know that we have classes in which we have trained militia folks, as it were, who are armed to protect the congregations. And I, I'm not being critical. I understand that we have to stop the hemorrhage if we're to grow an immune system. But think of what have we have become used to. It isn't did you just latch the door. It's did you put the, did you put the alarm on. We're, we're used to it. It's a common thing. And it's unbelievable. And it's like we have come together to somehow cower and quake thinking that if we feed this tiger, it'll eat us last. It's astonishing. And I remember today H.G. Wells uh, <laughs> in the time machine that goes 800,000 years into the future. And there are two groups of what had become uh, from the, the stream of what we know as human beings. And one were, were the Eloi, and they were the, the, the little placid folks, and they lived their life, you know, not thinking of anything. And when the alarm rang, they lined up, and the Morlocks, which uh, lived below the surface in a subterranean way, had, they kept them fed, etc., and they simply fed the tiger there. And I thought, what an astonishing thing, because here is the, the, the church that Jesus said, the gates of hell will not prevail against you. And gates are not offensive weapons. Gates are defensive weapons. And Jesus is saying, they're not going to prevail. You're going to crash them. And we have gotten used to the dark. And so that is, the, that is the, the black velvet that we've got to lay down so that when we cast the jewels of God's love, they're going to shine that much brighter. But that's where we are. But it's not the only story of where we are. And so if I could just share... And if you would walk with me as we build this and let some of my story, because I'm such a numbskull, as you'll learn, that you will, you will identify hopefully in the every man that, might, that stands before you right now, in the every person, I might say. And that is, I, I'm going to share this, and we're going to do something that you're not ever supposed to do in public speaking. 
But this is a smart, smart, smart group. And so here we go with your connivance. I'm going to break every rule of public speaking and hang, hang with us there, Crane Scholars. Don't do this. <laughs> and here it is. is we're going to put something as I describe it, and we're going to put it up here and tuck it up here, and we'll come back and get it. So here's what it is, because we need hope. And the hope must not disappoint us, as Paul said. It's got to be real. You know, they say you can, you can maybe live, you know, maybe 24 days without, without eating any food. And maybe you can live, I don't know, I think it's four days without any water. And you can live almost 10 minutes without any air. But you can't live one second without hope. And this must be a hope that does not disappoint us. So we need a miracle. Planet Earth needs a miracle. This terrestrial ball, as the hymn said, that's sitting as a blue, wonderful blue and white and brownish marble in the midst of the, the dark sea of outer space. And it is our one life boat. And here we are fighting each other like crazy and tearing up the boat to beat each other up with. And no one can survive in that ocean out there. Not one human being. And there's no way off of this with the 8 billion precious human beings that we have. And this has got to have an answer for us. And we must have hope. That's the beginning for all of us. And we need a miracle to have hope. Because everything appears to be tending to decay and destru destruction and collapse. All of the things. See, it is almost a lemon-like march to the sea and to our own demise. So here we go. Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein gave a speech in England. And he was introduced as standing on the shoulders of Sir Isaac Newton. When Einstein took the podium, Einstein corrected the introduction. He said, no, I don't stand on the shoulders of Sir Isaac Newton. I stand on the shoulders of Clark Maxwell, a great Scottish, wonderful, radically converted Scottish physicist, converted at the age of 22, and Clark Maxwell was the discoverer. There are four major forces that hold us together. I only really know what one of them is, and it's called gravity. And if I step one step out, I will give a great demonstration of gravity. But there's the weak atomic force, there is the strong atomic force, and there's the electromagnetic force. Clark Maxwell, in the, in the early 1800s, without any computers, was the discoverer and the progenitor of all of the laws that have to do with the electromagnetic force. And if you're uh, up to date on that, you can inform me a little bit later. I'll, it'll take me about a week to figure it out. But that was what Clark Maxwell did. He was brilliant. And they said that in Einstein's little private study, he had a painting of Clark Maxwell and, uh, and of Sir Isaac Newton and Michael Faraday. He was that important to Einstein. This guy was a smart, smart, smart fellow. And he said in a, his famous essay on singular points, Clark Maxwell said this, any assessment of history that does not take into account the possibility of miracle is a false assessment of history. I'm going to say that again. Any assessment of history 
that does not take into account the possibility of miracle is a false assessment of history. Now here's how he defined history, I mean a miracle. He defined a miracle as that which happens within history. But when it happens, it is so infinitesimally, statistically tiny that no one can notice it, and yet it has the power. No finite mind can possibly take note that this was a, what he called a singular point in history that changed everything. In other words, to look at history, and history is going A, B, C, and you're ready to go D, but a singular point occurs, and bang, it goes to another place altogether. And so what Maxwell is saying is any assessment of history that does not take into account the possibility of singular point mis uh, miracles is a false assessment of history. An illustration. Rome controlled everything. Who noticed that a little baby was born in Bethlehem? Of course, we believe angels and and shepherds and, of, and a few others did notice, but not Rome. It made no news, no nothing. And yet, that one baby grew and changed everything. A singular point. I always like to think if I was walking around the, lake, the Galilee Lake and I go past a group of guys that are laughing like crazy and they've got their arms around one another, and they just happen to be fishermen and a few others that have joined the band and, and a guy that they're cutting up with like crazy, who, by the way, is not wearing a white robe. <laughs> and, and you go past these guys and you will walk past them every time. And yet there is the possibility and the reality of a singular point. Who, who thought in 1809? Uh, except about Napoleon ravaging all of Europe, and who noticed that in, eight, in, in a little log cabin in northern Kentucky, a baby's born, who rises and changes everything in American history. Those singular points, and I'm going to say this evening that I am praying and I've prayed all day long that this could be a singular point. That someone here, some young life here, can so be moved beyond my words, but the Holy Spirit taking His Word into your heart in such a way that this point, someone arises and everything can be changed from the direction that we're going. That's been my prayer and change what looks like a nightmare into a daybreak of incredible hope. So we're not here to just to hear a speech. We've got to be here to make a difference. And the only way that we can make a difference is to come together. Not one of us on our own can go to all the world. But all of us, if we have a commonality of hope, and a commonality of comradeship and love. All of us can go to all the world. And that's a key for all of us on this solitary world in which there is no escape. And so consequently, with, with that hope, we're going to tuck that there and we'll come back to it. And just take that and put it there and, and now we've got to be able to understand that the vision to which we are called has got to be the common vision for all of us around which our entire being now is moved. We know that the will of each human being is reached through the emotions. And it does appear that the emotions have fled in this incredible movement of God's love visiting and living in, on planet Earth. And it looks like that the, I was at a, at, at a 
place in which they had had a pastor's class or something and and I was getting ready to speak and they went down the line and you know they they just said uh, you know Jimmy do you believe that Jesus is the Christ I said uh-huh and, and Mary do you believe that Jesus is the Christ said, uh-huh 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 and it came to this one girl she was huge and eyes were not focused and she Laurie do you believe yes I do I do I love Jesus and Jesus loves me I do and the guy the deacon sitting next to me leaned over and said she's a little bit challenged I thought the rest of those guys were the ones that were challenged. She got it. And the, the emotions have fled. You know, from, from the point at which there was a spirit of awe everywhere. And now, you know, we, we as they say, we, we go and we sing just as I am and we leave just as we were. And it's, there, there hasn't been that fire. And so that, that was true with me. I began to preach just like Henry Ward Beecher said that he went out to uh, hunt. He said there would be a loud report and a lot of smoke, but no game fell. He said the animals enjoyed it just as much as I did. He said, then I learned to preach. Well, I, I don't think I ever have because I would preach my heart out and the folks would go forth, and I never figured out where forth was. Because they show back up on Sunday, I preach, they go forth, they show back up, and the world was not changing. And then in 1977, my hero in the faith, a fellow Quaker, a, a Quaker by the name of D. Elton Trueblood, came to stay at my mom and dad's house. He was absolutely my hero. If you've ever thought about having time with your hero, I preached the fastest Easter Sunday sermon in the history of mankind, caught a plane from Amarillo, flew down to Shreveport for one week. Dr. Trueblood was staying in our home. He was speaking at uh, uh, Kings Highway Christian Church, and that might betray where Texas Christian University fits in. And so... That, that uh, but I did do this uh, because we come together. And so Dr. True Blood was there. He had written 33 books. He was my hero. I was uh, 32 years old at the time. And that night I got in late. He had already retired. He was 77. I thought he was older than dirt. And I'm 78 now, standing before you. And so, Dr. Trueblood, the next morning, I could hear this deep, resonant voice downstairs. I hurried and, and got down there. He was speaking to a little prayer group down there. And within one minute, Dr. Trueblood said this. He said, the American congregations are doing many good things, but they are not stopping the disintegration of our uh, society. And we have to find a way to do that. And that was my point to show an incredible brilliance. And that was, I said, Dr. Trueblood, we do live in a sick society. And Elton looked at me and he said, what do you mean by, and I thought he was going to say sick. So I was ready with this litany. And he said, what do you mean by society? And I said, I went as blank as a goon. And I said to him, Dr. Trueblood, that's really too deep for words. I'd forgotten he had his PhD in linguistic analysis. And he leaned forward and said, young man, don't ever say to me anything is too deep for words. If you can't say it, you don't know it. So within two minutes, I went down in flames in front of my hero. And he was, he was incredible because we spent the week together and he put his arm around me and he said, you know, I, I like the way you talk. And he said, I want to come to Hereford and I want to meet your people because I want to see 
what your preaching is producing. And all I thought in my brain was, I am a dead man. <laughs> and so I, when I got back on the plane and got back to Hereford, Texas, they never knew what hit them. And so we were putting them in Bible studies, everything, because it was going to be a year before he came. Now, let me just tell you, that's, that's great for Baptists, but you don't know what we had to go through to get folks, uh, disciples of Christ, into Bible studies, especially in West Texas. And I realized we had a problem. And when I realized that, I came down to Baylor. Really, I'm not lying. I came down to Baylor. Baylor in 1980 had won the Southwest Conference. And I saw a film that had Grant Taft the year before when they played TCU and they made a comeback. And Neil Jeffries, it was fourth down, but he thought it was third down. And they were about on the four, fourth, four yard line and Neil Jeffries threw the ball out of bounds to stop the clock. It showed Grant in the locker room, and Grant saying, and Jeffries was beside himself, and Grant said, lift up your head. We wouldn't have even been down there if it hadn't been you, and I thought, that is a man that is uncommon. And so I had this idea, because we couldn't attract men. We had a lot of women folk, and, but we couldn't activate the men if we were going to have an army. And so consequently, I went down. I said, if we could have something that attracted men, and it was Grant Taft. Baylor had won the Southwest Conference. Everybody knew Grant Taft. And I came down and I said, here's the idea. The idea is if you'll come and give a retreat, and in that retreat, if you will, uh, if you will do three things, speak three times. Number one, what does it mean to be a Christian? Number two, how do you become a Christian? We're going to go on a retreat, and then we'll we'll just do it one night, and then we'll go back and to the church, and we'll bring all of our unchurched friends, and you say, here's the meaning of the church, and I said. The ticket to be able to come on a retreat overnight with Grant Taft is to bring an unchurched friend. We had guys picking drunks up in the park. <laughs> they went everywhere to get a ticket because Grant Taft was coming. And then Grant came, and you remember Johnny Ray Watson? J Johnny Ray, 6'9", old basketball player, and Johnny Ray was our our pianist and we had all these cowboys and all these tough guys in and Grant shared what it what it means to be a Christian and Johnny Ray taught us a song opened my eyes Lord I want to see Jesus to reach out and touch him and say that I love him open my ears Lord and teach me to listen open my eyes Lord I want to see Jesus. And he, listen, these are some tough, tough guys. I promise you. This is Hereford, Texas, folks. <laughs> and these were tough guys. And they begin to sing that song with Johnny Ray. And then Grant preached, how do you become a Christian? And Grant did something we didn't really know about in the Christian church, but he had us pray to receive Jesus into our hearts. It was astonishing. The next day, we spent the next night in town, and the next day, everybody brought their unchurched friends to church. And when Grant finished preaching about the cross and the love of Jesus on that cross, and they gave the invitation to come forward, 83 men came forward on that day. This was in 1982. 83 men. They were kneeling, weeping all over the altar. It was the most, Grant was weeping. I was weeping. It was the most astonishing thing. I'd, I'd never seen anything like it. It exploded with the love of God. It was astonishing. 
I was such a numbskull that night I woke up in the middle of the night and thought, what in the world am I going to do with 83 ushers? <laughs> I had no earthly idea how to take this fire of God and, and don't put it in a curtain to burn the house down, but to put it in an oven that could cook a meal. I had no earthly idea how to mobilize men and put them, men and women, and put them together in a way that is systematic, in a way that could be real. I had no earthly idea. And yet, what happened was that the light and the, and the fire dwindled out as the years went on, and then I moved to Shreveport because I had had a life-changing experience in October of 1981 in which True Blood had sent me a 12-volume work of a study of history by Arnold Toynbee, and in the third volume, he defines society as a system of relationships. That is the ocean in which we live. And from that particular point, as I went back to Shreveport because I said, I know that relationships have rules, and those rules are just as ineluctable as the laws of gravity. And because those rules are that ineluctable that you must come together on what, is in co what you share together in common, and you must give yourself and feed that which you share in common, and that means that you celebrate your diversity, and that means when you have conflict within the covenant that you forgive and you come back together in, an, in, a, in a way that can re-bring communion to your life. And so it was like marriage was love, was like, I mean, like society was marriage on a grand scale. And I went back to Shreveport armed with the conviction that I need to learn if love really works. And that's where the whole idea of being able to now go to a street that was filled with crime and to see, I've preached about love my whole life, and to see that if love indeed works. And so I was white, I was affluent compared to those folks, I was a stranger, and I was scared to death. But if and truly, if truly love really works, I was gonna see, and so I picked a Saturday morning at 10 o'clock because I figured all the bad guys were drunk and hung over. And I drove down to Lawrence Street and I was about to go, pa I just said, I can't do this. I'm scared to death and so I'll just do a drive-by blessing because we had drive-by <laughs> shootings everywhere. And it was bless you, bless you, bless you, God bless you, and drive on. But I stopped and I, when I stopped, I got out and all these little kids came running up and I picked them up in my arms. Come on, baby, here, get on my back because I thought they're not going to shoot their kids. <laughs> and I had them, I'm, I'm just telling you what I did and why. And I climbed the steps of those houses and I said, I'm Mac McCarter and there's a group of us believe that if we'll get to be friends, we can change this world. Not many doors open. But I went back every Saturday at 10. And within three months, the people were sitting on the front porches of the row houses and waiting at 10 for their friend to come. I saw that love and friendship over, and I didn't say, have you been saved or anything. I just loved them and went to be their friends and be obedient. Love, love overcame being a stranger. It overcame my white skin and the difference. It overcame our socioeconomic difference and it overcame fear. And it was astonishing. And that's when I learned that it's a whoever love can change and save this world. Jesus said, whoever, whoever does the will of my Father 
They are my mother. They are my brother, my sister, and my mother. Whoever, I tell our team, give me a one word definition for whoever. Whoever. Whoever loves. And that's how I felt that this was, you know, this is our, to be obedient. And that's, that grew, that possibility and the reality grew. And I began to see that that's the answer for a world split asunder. Whoever, lo- whoever does the will of my Father. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. Go. Go in love. And so let me, let me share this. And then I know I've gone a little long, but this is so important for us, folks. Let me share this. I was obedient reluctantly for that, and I was reluctantly obedient when God asked me to, and really said, join this church, because I went to visit a black church right after I'd moved, and God just said, join this church, and I very clearly said to him, no, because, uh, and started giving the reasons. There, there were a thousand folks there, I was the only white folk there. And the preacher had been this wonderful uh, brother and, and uh, helpmate of Martin Luther King, and I wanted to catch up on the civil rights deal. Dr. Harry Blake, and, uh, and so during the invitation hymn, uh, and I said, I've never been Baptist either, and, and so my wife is not with me, and this needs to be a family to silence. Uh, uh, all my old friends are gonna think, well, there goes McCarter showing off, silence. And then God said, well, you don't have faith. And I went, that's a low blow, God. (laughs) And they had finished singing the invitation hymn, and I walked forward. No one more reluctantly joined a black church than me. And Dr. Blake took a hand filled with sweat, just going. And it took me three days to tell Judy what I'd done. I just said, uh, I said, pass the ketchup. I joined Mount Canaan Missionary Baptist (laughs) Church. And she said, well, that's okay, but, you know, I, I'm not called to do that. And I said, that's okay. And so she came to visit with me, and God did the same thing with her. <laughs> and so here we both are, and it was just an amazing thing because I had centered my life in understanding a whoever kind of love to be obedient to love whoever. But listen. Listen. While I was down on Lawrence Street, and I was down there for three years, I went with Mount Canaan to, we had a revival, and I went down with Mount Canaan, about five of us, and we did a corner. They always, when we have revivals, you go to the, you have a street assigned to you, and so we were at a corner street on Fannin Street, not knowing that the Bottoms Boys gang was down there. They even shot at police. That's how bad it was. So here we are, and we had a drug dealer that lived on Lawrence Street, but he was our drug dealer. And it was, he had four beautiful children, and that's, that was his economic uh, way to get going. He had four beautiful children, and I looked, and there's Robert walking up to a front porch of a rather large house, decrepit but rather large, down on Fannin Street. And I waved, Robert, Robert. And Robert looked around and saw me. I didn't know he was going in to get a supply. I didn't know that the Bottoms boys had leveled down on me. I didn't know that. Robert wasn't a churchgoer. Robert wasn't a Christian. And Robert looked and waved and looked at the windows. And Robert went to the rail, ran to the rail, and vaulted over the rail. And I went, this guy's glad to see me. And I started walking toward the house. And Robert ran and grabbed me. And I thought, he's really glad to see me. (laughs) Glad to see you, Robert. And Robert walked me back across the street. And I didn't know until the next day when one of the children said, Mr. Mack, did you know Robert saved your life? And I went, no. 
what happened? And then he told me what had happened. And I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe Why should he do that? And yet, here's a guy that showed greater love has no man than this. That he would lay down his life for his friends. I said, well, he's not, he hadn't come to Jesus yet. But he was evidencing the highest form of love that Jesus talked about. And I couldn't get that straight theologically. And this is critical because the one world can't come together unless we come together in that one love. And here was Robert demonstrating that. Four years later, I'm walking down the hall of Mount Canaan, and it's on a, uh, the month of Black History Month, and I walk down the hall, and the youth had done a poster, and the title of the poster was African American Leaders Who Have Helped Our Race. And my picture was on there. <laughs> I got to that poster and I went, yes! <laughs> love works and love wins. And that's the highest faith that we can have in the midst of an empirical reality in which kept contemporaneously and historically, it looks like it doesn't work. And it looks like it won't win. But it will. And I went, yes! And I walked around the corner and I went weak in my knees and leaned against the, the door. And I went, it wasn't my love. They had every reason not to love me. I was the whoever to them. And by being the who and recognizing I was the whoever, I'm the whoever to everyone. And it is the grace and mercy that is given when you understand that you are the whoever. That you are receiving. I had, they had no reason to trust our, our race. They had every reason not to trust our race in Shreveport, Louisiana in which there was a, an apartheid for all of my life until I left after high school. They had every reason not to trust us. And here they did embrace and trust and give. And that is unbelievably powerful to go inside of you, to recognize that in obedience we go to whoever and love them but then to recognize in mercy and grace that we are the whoever to every single one. And that's what it says in 1 John. Everyone who loves, everyone who loves is born of God. Remember Tennyson, come my friends. It is not too late to seek a newer world. Push off. And sitting well in order, smite the sounding furrows. For my purpose holds to sail beyond the sunset in the baths of all the western stars until I die. It may be that some great gulf will watch us, wash us down. It may be that we shall touch the happy isles and See the great Achilles whom we all knew. Though much is taken, much abides. And though we are not now that strength which in old days moved earth and heaven, that which we are, we are one equal temper of heroic hearts made weak by time and fate, but strong in will to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. A singular point. In some heart tonight, in some life tonight, in all of our hearts tonight, to resolve that it will be a whoever love that can change the whole world 
as we strike out together to really bring about a new creation, which is the only thing that counts, and the new being, immune from hatred. God bless each of you, and may God use us and take us and scatter us and bring us together in this age of discord to be his light. God bless you.